1830 to 1850, London was connected with, to other cities by railroads. It presented one problem, because up to this time, every city had its own clock, and own standard of time. That meant that in short runs, you could arrive at some place before you left the same place, another place. So it was decided in 1852 that they would adopt Greenwich Mean Time as the time used by all the people in England. So people, mail, raw materials, and finished goods started being transported by rail, and the railway stations became the cathedrals of the engine. In 1872, St. Pancras Station was opened. It was fronted by the Midland Grand Hotel, which just two decades ago was almost to be demolished, but it was saved by the Historical Association, refurbished, and it's open for business again. The railroad station itself behind the hotel was a masterpiece of steel and glass. It too has been refurbished, modernized somewhat, but still keeping to the traditional spirit of the 19th century construction. In 1874, Liverpool Street Station was opened, fronted by the Great Eastern Hotel, which now has a McDonald's on the bottom floor. It too has been refurbished and again, stayed faithful to the traditional style of brick, glass, and steel. But you can see the fine 19th century adornments still standing in place. In 1863, London went underground despite predictions of doom and death. And it became the underground an instant financial success, especially after Queen Victoria herself went down and rode in one of the carriages underground. This year, they're celebrating the 150th year of the underground. Quickly, lines spread across the city, both beneath ground and above ground, and new bridges came to be built. Remember, in 1832, the old London Bridge was destroyed. A new one was built in its place. This is a photograph of it from the year 1900. A new Blackfriars Bridge replaced the old one. In 1884, the Tower Bridge was opened. The Tower Bridge is actually a steel construction, and the stone towers are only facades covering the steel construction. It was meant as a drawbridge, of course, to allow boats to come upriver in the Thames, and here you see it with the drawbridge up. The first month it opened, the bridge was opened 655 times. Nowadays, it's open only 500 times a year. The engines originally employed to open the bridge are still operational. And the reason why it is so infrequently open now is, of course, the larger ships cannot get in upstream anyway, and more docks were built for them downstream. In 1881, an American, Thomas Edison, came with one of his inventions, and he supplied the Old Bailey and the Grand Post Office with electricity. It became immediately popular, and by 1900, London could boast more than 200 miles of illuminated streets. It is a century also of new shops and hotels. In 1849, Henry Charles Harrod bought an old dilapidated grocery store and started a mildly successful family business. By 1870, they still only had 16 employees, but by 1880, they had new family members in charge and over 100 employees, and there was a new attitude in the store. The traditional London shopkeeper attitude was that the customer was a nuisance. <laughs> Harrod's idea was that perhaps detail could be given to their concerns and needs, and they'd be treated civilly. And lo and behold, it worked and more and more people started coming to Harrods. They got new quarters in 1894, which is what you're looking at now, and in 1898, they installed the first escalator to bring people from the ground floor up to the first floor. And at the top of the escalator, they had a man with smelling salts and brandy <laughs> in case anybody passed out on the way up the escalator. In the 1820s, the British Museum got a facelift and moved into its present quarters. Now, during the time when it transitioned from the Montague House to the present quarters, it continued increasing its collection, of course. 
1815, one of the most extraordinary archaeologist adventurers of all times, Giovanni Battista Belzoni, had excavated away from Egypt a colossal head of Ramses II, which was purchased by the British Museum and is now one of the highlights of their Egyptian collection. In the 1840s, Henry Austin Laird was excavating away in Nineveh and Babylon, and those antiquities, too, came to grace the British Museum. And in 1852, the open courtyard was roofed over to create the reading room. Then and now. In 1852, also, the Science Museum was opened. It started out as the Museum of Ornamental Art. But rechristened as a science museum, they gradually began acquiring collections of machines and libraries of books on technological matters. In 1857, there was another spin off of the Museum of Ornamental Art, and that was the Victoria and Albert Museum. And its mission was to study the application of the fine arts to manufacturing. And then in 1881, the Natural History Museum opened. It was a spin-off of the natural history collection of Hans Sloan housed in the British Museum. And if the railroad station could be called the Cathedral of the Engine, the science museums could be called the Cathedrals of Science in London.